Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our online webinar. For those that don't know me, my name is Andrew Croxford, and I'm the senior partner at Thompson Cooper. And I'm delighted that actually over 160 people have registered to watch this webinar. So welcome to you all. During this short presentation, we will be looking at two main topics. The first will be given by one of my tax partners, Alan Mitchell. He will give a brief overview of the budget changes announced last Thursday by the Scottish Government Finance Secretary, Kate Forbes. And perhaps he'll get his crystal ball out and provide his thoughts and insight as to what might be in the UK budget to be delivered in just a month's time. After Alan has set out his thoughts, then our second speaker will be Elaine Cromwell. Elaine heads up our business support group at Thompson Cooper. And while furlough and payroll has dominated much of her life for the past year, today she's going to be outlining the latest changes on VET reporting following Brexit. Given this is a, a short presentation, there won't be an opportunity for questions and answers during the presentations itself. But at the end, we will highlight how you can contact us if you wish any further information about today's presentations. So without any further ado, I will pass over to Alan Mitchell, who will talk about the Scottish budget. Alan Mitchell. Uh, morning, everybody, and thank you for attending today. Um, I think it's fair to say that the Scottish Finance Secretary, Kate Forbes, has had a fairly challenging year. Uh, it, it was only just a year ago that she was certainly thrown in at the deep end uh, with only a matter of hours to prepare and pick up the 2020 SNP government budget uh, after the abrupt resignation of her predecessor, Derek Mackay. Um, she dealt with that challenge. Uh, she successfully negotiated the budget through Holyrood. Um, never an easy task for a, an SNP minority uh, government. And no sooner was that budget approved, uh, but Scottish Government finance response to the coronavirus pandemic was our next challenge. Uh, now today, uh, with COVID restrictions still in place, uh, economic activity probably 7% below where it was in post uh, pre-pandemic levels, uh, Brexit issues still to be resolved. There's little signal yet from Westminster how they might play out their budget in May, in March, sorry, uh, and in particular a Scottish parliamentary election uh, on the horizon in May. The Finance Minister certainly has a, a tricky task in terms of getting our 2021 budget correct. And as we can see here, there are three dimensions to her uh, budget, which are summarised in this slide. Um, the Scottish Government's COVID financial support is really focused around non-domestic rates relief and grant support for those businesses that have suffered under restrictions. And this budget really continues that commitment to support businesses in this way, uh, as they may be further restricted in the next financial year. But most of that offer of help is given with the caveat that for the Scottish Government to continue to deliver that support, they must receive support, support via their block grant and funding from Westminster. Um, there's been a focus again on non-domestic rates relief, which will continue, and a reduction in the poundage rates that are used to calculate our rates for our businesses. Many aspects of the budget, though, are dependent on continued support from Westminster uh, as Scotland shares that block grant from them. And certainly how the Westminster budget pans out will certainly determine how the Scottish budget evolves and finally looks to us once it's passed. With one eye to that election, though, um, there were a, a cent of tax uh, savings being offered by uh, the, the finance minister, although how these proposals will sit with possibly the Green Party, who may be required to pass that budget, uh, we'll only have to wait and see. But the starting point is really uh, to look at some of the changes that uh, have come through here. So if we can look at the next slide um, and these were the changes to the new thresholds 
uh, that will apply in Scotland. Uh, in Scotland, we've got five rates of tax, as you can see here, as opposed to the rest of the Q UK, where they only have three rates of tax. Uh, the rates of tax haven't changed as yet. They may change uh, after the March UK budget, um, but the thresholds have been increased by inflation other than the top rate uh, at £150,000. Now, don't get excited about that inflation rate. Inflation is currently running at 0.53%, so this is not going to change significantly the amount of tax that you will pay next year compared to previous years. The next slide gives an illustration um, for those who are earning £30,000. Um, if we can move on to the next slide. Uh, for those who earn £30,000, you can see there is a grand saving uh, comparing this year with uh, the following year of £16 per annum. So not significant. And much of this change is actually coming through the change in the personal allowance, which the UK government has already announced uh, as an increase for next year. For those that earn £50,000, the next slide shows um, that uh, benefit that will come through. The increase is now £62 per annum. Uh, and again, much of that, nearly half of that increase relates to the change in the personal allowance there. Um, the, how these marginal rates will pan out uh, dovetailing with income tax rates, we won't really know until we see how the UK government uh, announced their budget changes in March. Um, SNP will certainly argue that um, until they have charge of all the fiscal levers, then they have a difficulty in setting their budget. And I think the timing of budgets this year will mean that they'll deliver that argument once more. The next slide, though, does look at, at a tax that uh, Scottish government does have full control of. Um, land and buildings transaction tax came under the control of uh, uh, Holyrood in 2015. And in the first lockdown, um, there were measures which basically increased the nil rate band to £250,000 for LBTT to support the housing market. Um, from the 1st of April 2021, that new nil rate band benefit will be removed and uh, the nil rate band will return to £145,000 with the 2% band falling back in between £145,000 and £250,000. Uh, there is still the first time buyer's relief that's available for purchases up to £175,000 for new entrants into the housing market. The remaining focus of the Scottish budget was around support measures and budget allocations. And I'll finish off this part of the presentation by looking at some of those support measures that are offered. So if we can have a look at the next slide, the main change here was around non-domestic rates. Um, the, the basic property rate, the poundage rate as it's called, uh, has been reduced from 49.8 pence in the pound to 49 pence in the pound, reducing this rate to 2019-20 levels. Uh, this reduction in rates of 1.6% is obviously welcome, uh, but nowhere near reflecting the drop off in, e in economic activity that is happening uh, around Scottish business there. There's also been uh, continued support uh, by way of 100% non-domestic rates relief for the retail, hospitality and leisure businesses that existed all the way through the current uh, tax year. Uh, this relief has been guaranteed to be extended through April, May and June uh, of the coming uh, months. Um, Scottish Government underwriting that cost. Um, what they have said is that they hope that Westminster will come up with the funding for those three months, but if they don't, they will commit to supporting those businesses there. Um, and they have said that they will extend that relief even further beyond June if West Westminster come up with the funding packages. That to me sounds like a gauntlet being thrown down by Forbes to Sunak to come up with the money there. Uh, the final slide on the Scottish budget looks at grant support that will continue to be available. These were all grants that were available uh, in the current year and they will be extended into the next year, 21-22. Um, the Fresh Start uh, Relief Grant was available 
uh, which offered 100% non-domestic rates relief for businesses that had been uh, business properties that had been un unoccupied for six months uh, and have now been brought into use. Um, rates relief for an additional year, once they've been brought into use, uh, will be exempt there. Um, the business accelerator relief uh, provides support where businesses have altered premises, which in the normal course of things would have resulted in additional rates payable. This increase in rates will now be pushed back and deferred for 12 months before it comes in. And finally, the successful small business bonus scheme, which was introduced last year, which basically exempted 117,000 properties, business properties in Scotland, will now be rolled out into the next tax year. But the proviso in all of this is that funding is available for Westminster to support these schemes. Um, it's all very laudable to uh, offer these up um, uh, within the Scottish budget. But until they can secure the funding from Westminster, the Scottish Government will not be able to deliver those schemes. Uh, certainly, it sounds like a bit of a political game being played there. Um, so that's everything I want to really cover on the Scottish budget. Uh, if we can now turn to that crystal ball gazing that uh, Andrew mentioned earlier and see what may be coming around the corner in the Westminster budget, which is set for the 3rd of March. So firstly, let's have a look at this slide, and this gives us a hint of what the task is that faces the UK government. Uh, the Office of Budget Responsibility, the OBR, predicts that by April of this year, um, we will have borrowed an additional £394 billion pounds in this year to be able to support the COVID pandemic uh, support mechanisms. What's the money been spent on? Well, we spent £77 billion pounds on the furlough scheme, a um, significant amount. NHS and public bodies have required an additional £127 billion pounds to be able to support the COVID response. Um, grants and loans to businesses have required £66 billion. Pounds. And in addition, because of the drop-off in economic activity, tax revenues are going to be down almost £100 billion pounds this year. So a real problem facing the government, and it begs the question, how and when will Mr Sunak attempt to repay this debt? The next slide looks at some of the options available to him. The biggest revenue generator for the Treasury is income tax, VAT and national insurance contributions, delivering almost £480 billion pounds worth of receipts in a normal tax year, over 60% of the UK revenue requirements there. The problem is, though, the Tory manifesto that was delivered in December 2019, when they said there would be no increases in income tax, VAT or national insurance in the life of this parliament. Uh, great um, manifesto pledge for winning an election, but not much good once you're in the middle of a COVID pandemic. Um, the question is, is COVID a good reason to break that manifesto? pledge that they made to the electorate. If it wasn't, um, then it's unlikely we will see significant rate changes on these taxes. The second one noted there was a, a one-off wealth tax. Uh, the Wealth Tax Commission has urged the government to consider a one-off wealth tax. So how would this work? Well, illustration would be for anybody with wealth in excess of £1 million, there would be a five-year programme of charging 1% of your wealth as a one-off tax each year. It's anticipated that this type of tax could raise up to £260 billion over a five-year period and be the equivalent of increasing VAT to six, by 6% or the basic rate of income tax by 9%. So a real opportunity to raise additional revenue to repay that debt. However, straight away, you can start to look at this type of new tax and there'll be significant difficulties in both implementing, administering and collecting this tax. And Mr Sunak, the Chancellor, has indicated that this tax is very unconservative and really goes against party values. So I think it's unlikely we will see a new wealth tax introduced. The next slide does include a tax that has shown a bit more interest by Mr Sunak, though, and that's capital gains tax. It does only raise about £10 billion every year. 
Um, but the Office of Tax Simplification were charged with carrying out a report on capital gains tax. Their findings were that it was a tax that was no longer fit for purpose, they said. Uh, tax receipts were lumpy, and in most cases, capital gains were managed around the level of the capital gains tax annual exemption. Um, so they proposed that capital gains tax should be aligned with income tax, particularly in relation to their calculation and the rates that were used. Capital gains tax rates currently sit between 10 and 28 percent. Income tax rates are obviously between 20 and 45 percent. Um, now, um, given that capital gains tax uh, raises small, um, a small proportion of the tax reliefs required um, and the economy needs reinvestment just now, I think it's possibly unlikely that the Chancellor will see a whole change to capital gains tax in the forthcoming budget. He may defer that for a year or so, maybe 2022 at the earliest, and just choose to tinker around the edges on capital gains tax removing or pruning some of the reliefs that are currently available. Um, the other one mentioned there is inheritance tax. Again, not a big revenue earner there, um, and it's a fairly emotive tax for the Tory faithful, so significant reforms again are possibly unlikely. Um, Usual chestnut referred there, the removal of higher rate tax relief on pension contributions. This comes up every year. I'm not sure if it's the government or the pension industry that promote this. Um, Sunak has indicated that he's got a willingness to consider pension restrictions there, so we may see, see some changes around pension contributions. And finally, are we likely to see a significant increase in the rate of corporation tax? Um, I'm not so sure if we will see that significant change there. We might see a small increase. Um, we're looking for UK business to get back on its feet. So a significant change in this rate would be a barrier to that. Secondly, with Brexit done, we're looking to encourage inward investment. Increased rates of corporation tax may stifle, stifle that type of investment. So as illustrated in my final slide, the Chancellor has a similar three-dimensional issues in delivering the UK uh, government's forthcoming budget, continuing to deliver on COVID support, building on and supporting the government's post-Brexit strategy, and at the same time, trying to maintain a strong union with a forthcoming Scottish election in May. With this in mind, it could well be that a major shakeup of the tax system uh, may have to wait until 2022 when the economy has started to show signs of recovery. Uh, that's everything I wish to cover today. Thank you very much for listening. If there are any matters which you wish to discuss with us, please don't hesitate to contact us here at Thompson Cooper. Uh, I'll now pass on to Elaine Cromwell, who will cover changes to VAT return reporting following the Brexit transition. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. We'll start with an overview um, of the, the changes that are will be implemented as a result of the UK leaving the European Union. These changes will affect how businesses in Scotland, England and Wales record imports and exports on their VAT return. Northern Ireland, part of the Northern Irish Protocol, um, has a different set of rules for businesses there. This presentation is only to provide general rather than specific guidance, um, and it will focus on the completion of the VAT return. Uh, we will cover export documentation. It's been fairly wi widely publicised that there are complications, there are changes to the export doc documentation. Um, that businesses need to be aware of, but that's out with the scope of today's presentation. We can provide specific advice to clients uh, um, and we'd, we'd, we would advise you all to take um, advice regarding your own specific circumstances. You can also phone the National Advice Line, the number is there on the screen, or visit the government website for further information. So let's look at changes relating to exports. All EU sales now will be treated like any other exports. So sales of goods which are exported will all be zero rated now. EU VAT, however, may be payable depending on the goods and who your customer is on import into Europe and how, and how you um, arrange your, your delivery. 
As a result of the changes, many UK businesses will now need to register for VAT in other European countries. And sales of services to EU consumers, which were pre previously chargeable to VAT, will now be mostly out of the scope of VAT. There is some simplification, however, businesses in the UK will no longer need to complete an EC sales list on a monthly or quarterly basis. They will no longer need to complete box eight for sales to EC of goods to EC member states on their VAT return. And they will no longer need to complete the interest at declaration for exports. So what does that mean for the VAT return and specific types of sales on the VAT return? How will we record sales post-January? So this table explains various scenarios and how we accounted for the VAT and recorded the VAT on our VAT return before Brexit and how we will deal with it post-Brexit. So the first scenario is the sale of goods to EC, EC customers where the customer wasn't able to provide a VAT registration or wasn't in business. So a business to consumer sale. In the past, the distance selling rules would have applied. So we would have treated it as if it had been sold in the UK. We would have charged UK VAT, recorded the VAT chargeable through box one and the net value of the sale through box six. Following Brexit, if all the export conditions are met, then we can zero rate that export and record the value of the sale through box six only. But businesses who are exporting goods to EEC customers um, who are consumers will need to register for VAT in the EU, in at least one country in the EU, in order to make returns of VAT um, into the European Union. Moving then to sales of goods to business customers, so this would be for VAT registered consumer, uh, customers in the EC. Those sales previously were recorded as EC sales in boxes six and boxes eight of the VAT return. They were zero rated, but we recorded them in box eight on the VAT return. An EC sales list was also required in the past so that the UK could account for VAT due to other member states. Now those will continue to be zero rated if the export conditions are met but will only be recorded in box six on the VAT return. And it won't be a requirement to obtain the VAT registration of the customer in the EU any longer. In terms of sales of services to EC consumers, so this was people who were not VAT registered in an EC country, the place of supply rules haven't changed other than in relation to professional and technical services, the special rule now applies to all services provided abroad. In other, in other words, there's no distinction now between EU customers and rest of world customers. This effectively means that we won't charge VAT on services provided to EU customer, consumers and rest of world consumers. So the, the, the value of the sale will be recorded on, in box six only on our VAT return going forward. Business to business supply of services um, were previously out of the scope. However, we would have had to record those sales values as sale of services on the EC sales list. Um, the change, there's no change to how it's recorded on the VAT return these sales, but no longer a requirement to complete the EC sales list or to state it's subject to reverse charge. So moving on now to how imports have changed post Brexit. Purchases of goods from EC countries will now be treated like any other import. So that means the import VAT is payable when goods land in the UK. But the UK government recognising that this would create a cash flow issue for many businesses who had previously imported from Europe without incurring VAT um, on landing has introduced a new system called postponed VAT accounting um, for the import VAT that's, that's due, which we'll, we'll come back to in a moment. 
postponed VAT accounting, there are different ways of dealing with it, depending on whether the value of the consignment and also whether the imports are business to consumer or business to business. There will no longer be a need to record EC acquisition of goods in box nine on the VAT return. However, interest act declarations for imports will still be required throughout 2021. And that's because the government wants to, um, for statistical reasons, keep a track of the value of imports from Europe. The recording of purchases of services from abroad is unchanged as a result of Brexit. So what does that mean in detail in relation to our VAT returns? How will we will record purchases post January 1st, uh, 2021. So the postponed VAT accounting, can we go back one slide please? It not only applies to imports from the EU, it applies to all imports going forward. And when applied, it allows businesses to postpone paying the import VAT on landing and instead pay it and recover it on the next VAT return after the import. It's a choice, businesses can choose to use PVA and it will apply if the import documentation has been completed with your EORI number, your VAT number and confirmation that the goods are for business use. Uh, so businesses can request to use PV with their freight agent when they arrange the import. In order to apply the PV accounting in your VAT return, you will require a monthly statement from HMRC, which you will have to download from your Government Gateway account. And the link's there on the screen. HMRC say that these will become available in the first half of each month but will only be accessible for six months. So it will be important that businesses log on and download these, not only to record them in their VAT return, but also to keep a record for their VAT records for the required um, six year period. The old C79 forms will still be in existence and will be used for imports which are not covered by the postponed VAT accounting. But it's clearly going to be in most businesses' advantage to apply postponed VAT accounting rather than to pay the VAT due on landing. There will be a cash flow advantage to this. So how do we record postponed VAT accounting in the VAT return? For business to business import, in your next VAT return, you're going to download your statement and in box one, you're going to record the VAT due in that relevant period on the imports. In box four, you will include the VAT reclaimed on imports. And in box seven, the total value of the imported goods, excluding VAT, will be included. When a supplier abroad exports to the UK, goods that are worth less or in a, one consignment, goods which are worth less than 135 pounds, they will now have to charge VAT if they're to a consumer or Amazon and, and other online marketplace providers will be required to now collect the VAT on behalf of the supplier. And this is going to force UK VAT registration for a lot of suppliers um, which are exporting direct to customers in the UK. So on the next slide, you'll, you'll see that there's some distinction between imports that are greater than 135 and less than 135 pounds. Um, and that, that, that threshold marries with the duty um, and tariff thresholds. So how are we going to record, record purchases post January 2021? Can we move to the next slide, please? So for zero rated purchases of goods from suppliers in the EC, these will remain zero rated and be recorded in box seven only. Standard rated goods 
will previously would have been recorded as EC acquisitions and recorded through box two, four, seven, and nine in the VAT return. But we'll now, the recording of them in the VAT return will now very much depend on the consignment value and whether postponed VAT accounting has been applied. Where postponed VAT accounting has been applied and the value is less than 135, uh, greater than 135 pounds, we will record the values as described in the previous slides in box one, four and seven. And if you're using the C79, it will, you will record it in the way that you did before on boxes four and seven. Purchases of services from the EC and the rest of the world will continue to be treated under the reverse charge on our VAT returns. So moving now to software updates. SAGE have issued a new version, version 27, which contains new VAT codes to help customers deal with the postponed VAT accounting. Zero have also um, updated their software for an apply PVE adjustments option on the VAT return and QuickBooks similar to Sage have issued new VAT codes. As well as reading up on these new codes to use for the postponed VAT accounting, you should also check that none of the other VAT codes have changed that you, that, um, you previously used. So in conclusion, all goods exported from the UK now are zero rated and will be recorded in box six only. It's really important that you get your export paperwork correct and that you retain this paperwork for the required period of time to prove export so that you can zero rate. And if you're selling to consumers in Europe, you are going to have to back register in another country in Europe. All goods imported into the UK will now have import VAT applied, but this can be postponed. And there are some changes relating to the supply of services to EU customers now in the um, EU and that they will now be out of the scope of VAT. So that concludes what I wanted to say today. Um, if you do have any specific questions about accounting for VAT on your VAT return post-Brexit, then please do get in touch with us. And I'm now going to hand over to Andrew Croxford for the concluding remarks. Thanks very much for that. So that, that concludes a short presentation this morning. I'd like to thank you for attending and hope you found something of interest or relevance to you or to your business. I'd also like to pass on my thanks to Alan and Elaine for their presentations today, which is always were well, very clear and, and well presented. Before you log out, there will be an opportunity to provide feedback on this webinar. And given the lockdown, our normal budget presentations aren't possible. So it is likely that this will be the format we use in March following the UK government's budget. Your feedback is much appreciated and helps us with planning our future events. We will be sharing this morning's presentation after this, we've recorded it and it will be uploaded onto all usual digital platforms. We are not expecting it to the same online success as the sea shanty singing postman, but if you've got a colleague or a, uh, or a friend who may benefit from the presentation, then please pass on the details. There are now beginning to see some growing signs of optimism that with the vaccine rollout, a new normal may soon emerge. But in the meantime, on behalf of my partners and all of the staff at Thompson Cooper, we hope that you and your family and your work colleagues stay safe and we look forward to the day coming very soon. We may be able, be able to meet up again as we've done in the past. So uh, take care out there and uh, thank you for attending this morning's webinar. Thank you.